Uh, hello, everybody. Thank you for coming to the session on closing the AI gap. Uh, we're very uh, happy to present here at the Big Data Platform uh, this uh, this really nice uh, panel discussion. We've got three really wonderful panelists on board. And the overall, before I jump into the uh, introduction for all of our panel discussions, I wanted to give a, a brief overview of what this discussion is about, sort of why we're doing it. So AI is not a, a new uh, technology, uh, you know, at all. It's it was really developed in the 1950s and 60s. It took shape uh, once computational power, you know, became more uh, more involved and and more kind of uh, ready in the early 2000s. Um, and it's it's really been embraced in a lot of different aspects of of business and technology and in our lives. I think we're probably most familiar with some of the social media type AI. Facebook and, and Google and search engines. Um, and uh, we were less sort of familiar with what's been happening in the agricultural space. I, I think that there's really been a, uh, and largely there has been a lack uh, or a bit of a lag in, in integration of AI and machine learning and, and just technology in general into the agricultural fields. Um, you know, this is starting to change over the past, let's say, five or so years. We're seeing some of an explosion of integrations of really cool AI innovations and technology um, into agriculture, but been driven for the most part in really developed uh, industrial agricultural uh, components and typically in the developing world. And we as, as the CGIR and I think this community of practice that we've been building is really focusing on how can we bridge the gap in technologies so that we can start integrating um, some AI and technology and innovations in the context of smallholder farmers. You know, we know that uh, there's a lot of social, social issues around the world uh, with poverty, with food security, um, with political instability, uh, with now resisting with COVID-19, with, with potential uh, globalization of, of global pandemics. Um, and a lot of these uh, issues are really focused around the developing world. You know, these are the areas that we're seeing a lot of um, uh, large population growth, uh, we're seeing a lot of social unrest and we're also seeing that these are some of the areas particularly in the tropics that are more vulnerable to the the, the outcomes of climate change so we, we believe that there's a lot of applications here and potentials you know to really uh, help address the sustainable development goals particularly in the context of smallholder farmers um, but again there's this gap between what's currently available and integrated with ai in the general community um, and then what's happening in agriculture and and really what is the driving forces behind sort of this lag that we're seeing between other things and and in in agriculture. So we want to to have a discussion and arrange a, a panel around this theme. And to do this, we've uh, assembled a, a really fantastic group of, of panelists, and I'll introduce them. Um, I'll start with on my screen from left to right. Uh, in, in other than that, no really particular order. So uh, our first discussionist. Um, let's see, would be Praveen uh, Pankajakshan. And so Praveen is the Vice President of Data Science and AI at Kroppen. And Kroppen's an agritech startup uh, based out of India. And he's got extensive expertise um, over many years in the application of signal image processing, pattern recognition, and machine learning. Uh, so next in our, in our list is Arla Dermondi. Uh, and she is the Director of Advanced Products at Maxar. And Maxar is a, is a satellite imagery um, company that produces some really fantastic products. Um, many of you might have known their previous incarnation, which was uh, Digital Globe. So then Arla has the expertise in product design, management, and the development at an international level. Um, some of her personal background is in environmental sciences and, and agriculture. Uh, and then uh, last but not least, Uzupenda Reddy Vuyuru. And Upendra is a senior software engineer at Microsoft Research um, based in Hyderabad, India. And I know they're also doing some really fantastic work um, that he'll present on, on agriculture. So I think all of us um, and all of you have really fantastic expertise um, in both uh, machine learning technology, but also in looking at how these technologies will really interface with agriculture and how we can you know, bridge these divide and lag between um, other types of fields and agriculture with, within regards to artificial intelligence and technology. Um, so with that, um, Praveen, would you like to start us off um, in, and give your presentation? Thanks, David, for the uh, very nice introduction. And uh, 
Um, so um, today, uh, you know, I just wanted to uh, touch upon uh, a couple of things as far as the uh, closing of the AI gap is uh, concerned. And um, there are, uh, you know, three things um, that I wanted to a little bit uh, talk about um, uh, as uh, gaps that are currently uh, present. Um, in my own uh, experience and understanding uh, for the many years that I've worked in this field, um, knowing both from coming from both um, technology side and applying it for agriculture, right? Um, so skill, action, uh, strategies, um, and partnership, right? Um, so um, I wanted to actually uh, divide this, um, the aspect of um, skill um, itself into um, three categories, right? Um, and uh, the first one is uh, largely about data, right? When we talk about uh, GAP, um, and this is, uh, you know, practical problems that uh, I have faced, uh, you know, in the many roles that I've had, um, is that we have a variety of data sources that come in, you know, uh, it could be uh, the genomic data about the, um, the seed uh, that we're interested in, um, um, or it could be at the lab level data. Um, it could be um, um, at uh, proximal imaging uh, coming from the field um, in close proximity by using either uh, mobile phones um, or even um, some uh, low altitude uh, uh, cameras like uh, drones and then high altitude of uh, satellite imaging, um, the weather data, and uh, also sources like uh, the IoT, right? Um, which could be soil moisture um, sensors, um, you know, pushing data to the cloud. Um, or, uh, or even offline, um, right, uh, storage of data and then, um, and then pushing. And uh, um, apart from this, this is just the garment of um, sensor data that we have. Um, and if you can consider even um, any data itself coming as uh, sensorial data, then uh, up, you also have the annotations, you know, the ground crew, the um, the subject matter expert, which could be a farmer or an agronomist who add uh, their own contextual data, um, or the text data, which also gets uh, introduced, right? Um, so all this uh, from the whole uh, data source and, um, you know, uh, how to ingest this becomes a huge uh, challenge, right? Now, um, often I find uh, myself in situations um, and uh, where, you know, the there are these new data sources and, um, you know, we want, we like to ideally use. So uh, data science and AI uh, comes almost at the, you know, at the, towards the very, very end of this uh, whole uh, workflow process and uh, getting the data uh, in um, becomes a big challenge, right? And um, I, I can clearly see that there is, uh, while there are certain industries which have really advanced uh, in this field, um, there are other um, organizations and industries which are still um, catching up, right? So there's definitely is, um, is a gap in this uh, particular area at least. Um, and making all of this data ready for what we call as analysis ready data or uh, optimized for certain, um, certain applications like cloud optimized or if you're uh, deploying it for deep learning algorithms. Right. Um, so how to bring the entire set of data, like now we are talking about sitting on top of this data and converting that to information and knowledge that we can use uh, to bringing it to the uh, computing resource and to the, um, the learning systems that we're interested in, right? And the second uh, aspect of this, uh, which there is a gap is that now we are not only deluged with data, but we are also deluged with a choice of a source of data and also tools that are available, right? Um, so one can also think about, should I go for on cloud or on premise? Um, uh, you know, the choice of course are many, uh, how to orchestrate these workflows that, uh, you know, that I have my data ingestion pipelines, my computing pipelines. Um, you know, how to be best take care of that. Um, so all of this uh, is also another um, skill that uh, has to be acquired over a period of time, right? Um, and uh, as more and more tools are introduced, uh, there is obviously uh, a learning curve and time that it takes to adopt these uh, also. And um, then uh, finally is um, the time that it comes for um, uh, actually talking about the models and the 
um, the learning systems itself, right? Um, which is, uh, you know, which could be, uh, you know, largely like if you look at the machine learning and uh, AI systems where it's progressing over a period of time, it could be the classification algorithms, the supervised or unsupervised learning systems, but that's only like, you know, there itself you have the gap um, um, in terms of uh, what are the latest algorithms being developed, right? Um, either in the classical machine learning or the latest developments in deep learning that we are now seeing. Um, and uh, also in terms of uh, the choice of uh, languages uh, to use as well. So while Python and R are almost ubiquitously used, there are some new um, tools and new algorithms, uh, sorry, new uh, softwares, uh, which are also uh, coming into the field. So comes with it, the model uh, lifecycle, how to track them, how to orchestrate them, version control, how to deploy them, um, right, uh, in, in an uh, in the containers or, you know, how to monitor, um, you know, bring it into production, right? So this is the entire um, uh, thing, um, you know, which is currently, um, you can call it as uh, a complete workflow from data computing to, uh, to the learning systems. And we are also seeing a paradigm shift, right? Earlier, the, uh, a lot of the AI systems, like uh, also David rightly pointed out, was restricted in the math, and then it becomes more of engineering and computing. And now there's a lot of also science getting involved in it. So it's not data alone, but the scientific aspects is also coming into the picture. So all of this is uh, elements which have to be considered uh, when we look at this whole element of um, um, the gap that is there and how to close them, right? Um, I'll, I'll just stop there and, uh, you know, here, and uh, we'll be happy to um, address this uh, more in, in during the panel discussion. Great. Thank you, Praveen. Uh, <clears throat> you mentioned some really interesting things, and uh, one of the things that I, I, I highlighted two of the, of the points that you talked about. One was, was data, the other one was funding sources or funding allocation. So on the data side, you know, as we know, machine learning and, and AI are very data hungry, right? So I think a lot, of, a lot of people would say that we need tens of thousands, if not millions of data points to really make these algorithms really work well. And we, we have a lot of supporting data coming in. Like you mentioned a couple of really good sources, Pravin. You mentioned satellites, you know, IoT, um, drones. But from my experience, we find that a lot of good training data on the ground has been is missing and, and difficult to come by. Uh, what's your perspective on, on, on uh, maybe the, the presence or lack of, of training data? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a great point. Um, and I think that is also, um, you know, while we, when we talk about lack of data, it's not actually uniform. So um, um, for example, there are certain, if you look at uh, certain crop types, right? Um, they require probably um, a more number of, uh, if you're looking at in terms of uh, uh, satellite signature, maybe they need more data points to, to actually uh, also train the algorithms. While certain other crops, um, crop detection might not need so, right? Um, so there is also, uh, and that's where I talked about this idea of uh, um, data sharing, right? Um, where we can also share uh, across geographies. So uh, sometimes we are also restricted in uh, probably in um, data collection in certain locations. And, um, you know, uh, for example, uh, foundations like Radiant Earth and everything have been offering their, uh, some of the annotated data um, available um, during some of the, uh, you know, um, hackers, uh, ha hackathons like um, uh, Zindi or Kaggle and things like that. So uh, that's actually um, one way uh, to address it. And the other way is actually crowdsourcing it. Um, right. Um, so there are uh, also certain um, um, uh, certain uh, tools available now where we can actually also request for uh, data verification. Um, so if, even if we are not located uh, in the same uh, in the same area or region, um, you could request somebody else to actually go and check that for you. Um, and, you know, bring that all in one space in the cloud, you know, I'll call that a data lake or any other source. Uh, so all that is now uh, getting possible, but uh, they say that uh, data is also expensive. Uh, so how much of data do we need? Um, I think that's a call also we'd have to take. Um, Great. Uh, well, I have so many more questions, but I, I think mm -hmm. in the scope of time, uh, hand it over to Orla. Okay. 
hello everybody and, and thank you so much for the opportunity to, to speak today to, to everybody on the on the bridge and everybody in their offices and homes around the world. Um, so yeah, today I'm going to talk about from, from our perspective, and I was really glad that in, in our last discussion we, we touched on the ecosystem and the ecosystem of data and partners and, and funding sources. And the company where I work right now is, is, is a big believer in that ecosystem and we are a member of that ecosystem. So we're, we're a publicly traded company, Maxar. What we do is we own satellites. So we essentially image the world every day. We image about 3.5 million square kilometers every day. That's a lot of pixels. I'm not quite sure what that number is. I think it's trillions of pixels. And those pixels, as you can see, each one of these bars represents the density of imagery we get um, over a year. So where we're, you can see that we're imaging of course, some of the heavy, heaviest populated areas of the world. Um, and that's obviously where we try to direct our satellites. We have, we have high resolution satellites and typically our resolution, our resolution goes from 50 centimeters on the ground to 30 centimeters. And that's only going to improve next year as we will launch our Legion class of satellites. And so one thing to just, inform everybody about our satellites. Our satellites, they are not traditionally known as high revisit satellites. Um, they are not traditionally known as, as um, high revisit satellites, but with Legion, what we are doing is we are really increasing the revisit of our, of our constellation to multiple times throughout the day. And so particularly as we look at food security, what that will mean is many more opportunities to capture a clear image of areas where we need information about the status of the food chain, whatever aspect of the food chain it is. And so today I was asked specifically to talk about closing the AI gap. And I just want to maybe talk a little, go back to a previous point I made about the data. So you will see here how many pixels we collect every day. Um, no one person can even imagine looking at these pixels and examining where the best information lies. And so fundamentally, as a company, we have had to close the AI gap. Um, traditionally, we're a company of photogrammetrists and image scientists, and we spend a lot of time thinking about spectral science. More and more and more and more, we've had to close the AI gap within our own organization, and then also help our customers close the AI gap to access the information in our imagery. So as a company, I just mentioned, we have had to close the AI gap within our own organization and essentially bring in expertise, have our research scientists learn new expertise around data science, around Python, around database management, around training data, conflation, all of these, all of these skills and tool sets that allow us to ourselves access the great information in the pixels and also manage those pixels better for our customers. But what we have also tried to do is really learn from our customers, our collaborators, and our partners in the ecosystems that we work in. And particularly within the food security space, um, we've done a lot of work with colleagues like the famine early warning systems. Um, our imagery is useful in that it provides data at a large area over areas that may be very difficult to get that data. And an example of that is right here, we have a project that we did in Southern Malawi, where we used a segmentation approach to outline field boundaries and do a cropped area classification across a very large area in 2017 and 2018. And what we did was we worked with colleagues in FuseNet across the USGS and USAID to essentially train the data to predict cropped area across a diverse array of crops. And we got a really good high level classification of actively cropped, which can then of course be used to get into much more detailed analysis of what are the crops, maybe where, what's the crop health look like with a, an on the ground system. And that's where we really also need to bring in AI to get to that signal processing that's required to assess the health of the food chain and the food system in an area at a particular time. Um, another example where we see 
a lot of potential for AI and where we need that AI skill set is just on the signal processing for the factors that impact crop health. Um, pest movements, pest occurrence, both in the year and then in a more predictive fashion, taking in historical weather patterns, taking in um, historical pest outbreaks and crop areas and, and even economic and social factors. So really one of the things that we try to do is use maybe some of the techniques around AI that we've used in more traditional feature extraction and taking that signal processing work and apply it with our colleagues in food security space to, to help predict more complex um, or to help predict in a, in a more simple answers to more complex problems such as um, pest likelihood outbreaks. And I know there's been a lot of work done with this kind of data and this kind of complex problem solving in particularly areas of fall armyworm and some of the banana pests where it's really, really quite challenging over large areas to predict what will happen and when. And there AI is invaluable as you're integrating local on the ground sources, which with much more maybe distant um, data as well. So one of the other examples where we've seen a really excellent application of AI, again, through our own operations and through working with, coll with colleagues, this time in the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, was just understanding as part of investigations into potential food security, as economic and social health, we looked at an area in Tanzania and tried to map all the buildings from space. And AI was completely important here. And we needed a lot of skills around database management as well, and just extracting and improving the output of an AI um, process. And so this image here is Tanzania. And what you see here is a representation of image strips that our satellite takes. We actually use a process in the cloud with a lot of AI for material selection. And by that, I mean finding materials, images without clouds, which is harder than you would think, or finding images with the right look angle, looking straight down upon the land surface so that you can get a really good representation of the land. And what we create is this is called a base map. It's a mosaic, essentially, tiled together. And the matching of all those strips, the creation of a seamless picture that's completely AI driven to represent a smoothing of the surfaces across the whole area of Tanzania. And because you have a contiguous image now of Tanzania that's up to date, then you can run an AI driven <laughs> um, building extraction algorithm. And so this represents all the buildings in that year in Tanzania. Um, it's, it's an semi-automatic extraction. You run the algorithm and then there is some slight retooling um, to correct off building edges at the end. But without the ability to process very rapidly um, that, that machine learning and AI gives us, we would not be able to do this work. And without the ability to create a contiguous surface to facilitate that processing, um, we would not be able to do this work. And so just kind of in conclusion, one of the points I just wanted to make is that we want to work with users of our imagery to really understand where the scale and the precision in our imagery can help solve their problems and then work together on developing solutions, typically around AI, to kind of close the gap between the potential and the reality of the information and the value in our imagery. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Orla, thank you. Um, Pendra, uh, Praveen, if you have any, any questions, just, just jump in. Yeah. Uh, remote sensing data is necessary for doing the agriculture precision, agriculture precision farming. Uh, but when you are trying to do the modeling, uh, I mean, when you are trying to solve any of the data science problems, we also need the ground truth data along with uh, the remote sensing data. Remote sensing data is not sufficient to deduce any of the conclusions. So probably one aspect that we need to think about is how do we combine the remote sensing data with the data from the other sources as Praveen mentioned uh, 
uh, like drones or the IoT devices and how can we fuse them is another aspect that we need to look into it. I 100% agree. Um, remote sensing is nowhere near sufficient to really get like kind of information that drives decisions with real consequences. Um, I think a couple of areas where we've struggled is just the training data. And we've worked with CGIAR, we've worked with Fuse to ground truth some of the information we're collecting so that at least that training data going in and then that Fuse project that I talked about, we worked with people on the ground to kind of validate the accuracy metrics that we were getting. And I think also as well, you know, we collect a lot of imagery, but even collecting every day, you don't get a perfect image every day. And you may not get that perfect image when corn or sorghum is going through its reproductive stage and it is under heat stress. You know, if there's a week that you have heat stress around pollination, then your crop is lost. And so there, I think, satellite provides an excellent context, an excellent baseline, and it's an excellent way to remotely monitor. But you must integrate with maybe IoT or even just the, the farmers walking through the fields with their mobile, you know, take a picture. And then it's, it's, it's all about data linkages and then the processing of the signals into a, a single result. Makes sense. Makes sense. Maybe I could jump on next for the question, Orla. Um, the, you know, these technologies Maxar, that Maxar is developing are really amazing. Uh, and I think they're geared towards, and, and a lot of the use cases has been at the landscape scale, you know, on the, on the regional, national, or even continental scale. But I think what's one of the cool things that you're doing now is you have these products that are really sub-meter. And so you get really high levels of spatial resolution and you're increasing also the temporal resolution. So, I mean, that opens up for a lot more nuanced approaches to looking at, at things at the village level or sub-village level. Um, and I think there's, there's a bit of a, of, a, of sort of a disconnect here, right? Uh, on the landscape scale, things like FuseNet are fantastic where you get a bunch of, of collaborators together and, and some really like powerful computational resources and able, and able to, to you know, address these large questions. But how about the individual users or smaller groups and organizations that are you know, based in, let's say, in Africa or South Asia, who have a lot of really local questions to answer, um, but maybe have, have need maybe like a more access to, to data and, and, um, and, and access to your platform. How is, how is Maxar looking at how to engage with, with those types of organizations? No, I think that's a really good question. There's, there's two ways. Um, and all of them, both of them acknowledge the fact that, you know, we actually, we have people on the ground, many people on the ground in, in India, in Pakistan, in, in Africa, uh, South Africa and Tanzania and other countries in, on the ground. But of course, these are incredibly large countries. <laughs> so um, we don't have enough people to engage. We're, we're not like an agricultural company with extension officers moving around um, the region. So I think there's two ways. One of them is a very like an umbrella organization. So the work we did with Fuse, the work we did with Gates, where you're making that data available. Specifically with Gates, we have done projects where we make the data available in a large, in a large cloud-based system that then remotely or on a desktop, you know, after downloading, a local user can segment. Okay, I just need for this particular town or this particular village. It's, it's all there. And so there is an infrastructure, a very large cloud-based infrastructure that can then be queried. And that's really important is to, to ensure that everything you're making out there is easily queryable for that local problem. And often local and dispersed, you know, it's, it's four villages in Northern Tanzania or something like that with a very specific, okay, I just need buildings, roads and grain silos, you know? So it's, that I think is really important. We need help with that cent like that infrastructure that enables sharing with more local institutions. The other thing too though, and, and again, it relies on an infrastructure. We work quite a bit with OpenStreetMap and we have an open data program where we will make data available in OpenStreetMap. We have mapathons. We just did a very recent one on features in, Af in Nigeria specifically. Um, and that's a way for 
remotely anybody to engage with the data without going through kind of an umbrella organization. OSM is free to everybody. So there are kind of two ways that we've worked with um, that have been quite successful and scalable while reaching the, the individual kind of village or county level. Um, however, we do, you know, our, our people in the areas, we also work with, you know, we'll work with embassies of different countries to really focus on specific problems. And, you know, like any company, we use our local contacts where we, where we have them. So, but I think we, particularly with CGIIR and CIMIT, you know, we're open to better ways of getting the data to the people who need it. So that's absolutely something we're open to. Let's, uh, uh, in, the, in the scope of time, let's maybe jump over to Upendra and, and give the floor to you. Hi, everyone. Thank you for providing me an opportunity to speak. Thank you, David, for setting up the context. To feed the growing population, we need to infuse AI across agriculture value chain to increase productivity, efficiency, and output. We can infuse AI at each and every stage in farm to fork scenario. For example, AI can be used for precision farming to, en to enhance agriculture productivity. And AI can be used to fix inefficiencies in agriculture supply chain. Lot of exciting machine learning work is happening from academic side. In most of the academic research data used by academic researcher is very limited. But if we want to translate the academic research into uh, to real farmer, it's a very big challenge. So model inferencing on million farmers and million uh, acres is an uphill task. Engineering scale is a must for taking research work into a production model. For example, uh, we are working with USDA to translate the research work to run and inference hurricane damage detection model on five plus million acres. Without engineering scale, USDA was taking around three to four weeks. With the engineering scale, we are able to reduce the model inferencing from weeks to a weeks to hours. To solve the data and scale problems at Microsoft, we are working on open agri platform. The goal of the open ag platform is to enable seamless data collection and generation of models and insights for agriculture data. Today, as Praveen mentioned, today data is fragmented and is siloed with various data providers. Every service provider who wants to generate insights in agri world has to write pipelines to these data providers, be it satellite data, be it weather data, be it farm equipment data. One of the things open ag platform aims to do is to make it really simple to really pull uh, data from satellite, weather, and farm equipment pro providers. Some of the representative providers are listed on the left-hand side. These are not exhaustive list. Once we have a pipeline to pull the data, next problem is hi uh, handling different variations of the data, be it spatial data, be it temporal data, be it custom data. There is no one technology which can go and uh, solve this problem. Hence, we are creating a spatio-temporal store to that will allow to store all these different data types in one storage optimized for retrieval. Once the storage is done, data scientists and data analysts can use the high-level SDKs that query the data in bulk. Once the data is generated, they can take the data to their choice of analytics or machine learning data, data systems. And these high level SDKs help in creating standardized schemes to query and reason through data from different sources in a consistent way. And it also helps in fusing the data between different data sources and generates insights by rapidly training and building AA models across the data sets. With the advent of deep learning models and the data hungry models, it, it is the need of the hour how to do the distributed training on large amounts of the data. To close the AI gap, we should enable the Agri Echo platform to build AI model, uh, AI ML models easily without worrying about engineering scale or any kind of data formats. To summarize, we are building an open ag platform to democratize agricultural AI. We are taking a four pronged approach to enable the data scientists and the data analysts to build the models without need to invest in deep learning and AML resources. 
the first one is we want to act as a platform to acquire aggregate process and store the agriculture data from multiple sources in a geospatial store once the data is stored we want to enable everyone to query and reason through data from uh, from different sources in a consistent way we are also working on cutting edge research to provide secondary data like cloud free images uh, if you take example uh, radar signals can penetrate through the clouds whereas optical signals cannot so we are working on combining the optical and radar satellites data using the deep learning techniques to create a cloud free satellite images and we would we would also like to create a marketplace where microsoft can uh, microsoft built models and the third party models will be available so marketplace would give a jump start to a agri focused enterprises and the startups Great, thank you, Upendra. Um, yeah. So, uh, uh, Praveen or Orla, any any comments? Um, yeah. Um, so I so the, uh, in this discussions, um, something triggered, and maybe um, uh, it's also an interesting point uh, to think about is um, especially we talked about different geographies, right? Um, and when we are talking about different geographies, the size of the land holding is, is something that we often talk about, uh, small size uh, uh, land holding farmers. And uh, if you're looking at, you know, this, uh, uh, this idea came from Orla's uh, slides and also from uh, Upendra talking about open ag platform, um, is, um, uh, is this idea of when, when we talk about democratizing this as well, when we are talking about small landholders, you know, even looking from uh, from the satellite images, it's difficult to determine the field boundaries. For example, right? Uh, we have used uh, also deep learning to build uh, field boundaries, and uh, depending on the resolution of the image that you take, uh, you know, these can be either uh, very well defined or it's very fragmented. Um, right, and if you're looking at somehow democratizing this, then we also have to in the future look at options uh, where uh, some of these data sources is available um, at uh, at uh, you know at a cost which is uh, not uh, not very humongous for uh, certain users as well. Right, uh, so th there is of course a, a trade-off to make because if you're looking at uh, very low resolution, you can look at large swaths of land, but then you know you can't get like uh, plot level boundaries at uh, very precise uh, precise information, right? But high high resolution images are expensive, and then you're but you know they they do um, you know you need more computing resources, but you know you the boundaries and you know the inferences that we make from them are more precise. Right. So I just wanted to trigger this thought as well and uh, wanted to know what uh, you guys think about it. Yeah, I, I completely agree. So most of the farmers, if you take the scenario of India, right, most of the farmers are poor farmers, so they can't effort, um, they can't effort at a cost where they can acquire the satellite imagery at a higher price. So it always uh, good, it always a good idea to democratize the AI and the data. And I think one one thing that we found to be successful too is, again, you know, you don't expect the farmers to be buying satellite imagery, but farmers may be what, I think what some of the companies have done and my own previous company did this quite a bit, you know, as an incentive to a farmer to buy their seed or to buy whatever treatment they are selling, they offer a service you know, and that service, we as satellite imag um, imaging companies, as data scientists, we help them build that service. And that service is, you know, it becomes profitable because you're getting a return on investment from customer stickiness, because ultimately it is about retaining that customer. Um, I think though something else we can do maybe with more um, organizations that are working directly with farmers is, we can have a two tiered approach to the imagery as well. You know, you don't need 30 centimeter imagery everywhere for the decision, but if you're seeing something, you know, it's, it's a tip and cue. Okay, you have something really great on a, on a lower resolution. Let's go in and maybe at certain times of the year, we get that high resolution because you, you just don't need it. And I think it's really important to know when you need that precision versus a more broad approach um, as well, so. Agreed. 
Hey, you know, I saw um, a, a very strong linkage between, you know, Pravin and Upen, and I can also link this back uh, to you, Arla, at Maxar. You know, Pravin, when we first started chatting and when you were, you know, talking about the, your background and the things that you're doing, one of the, the issues that you mentioned is access to sort of pipelines, to, to analytical pipelines, how there's a large and steep learning curve you know, to working with large amounts of data. And if we take, you know, Orla's example of, of Maxar and satellite imagery data, uh, these are some really, really complex uh, data sets that are, that are quite large. Um, and so, Pendra, one of the things that you showed was that you're developing a platform that could, I think, easily and quickly allow multiple users or users maybe with less background in programming or ex experience in, in working with these large data sets to be able to access this type of data. And I think that's a really excellent way to address Pravin's question um, and, and really democratize the access to, to these types of pipelines. And uh, or Arla and her company um, also have a really interesting uh, tool called GB Books, which essentially kind of try to do the same thing, right? Try to, to be able to take a really complicated um, uh, data pipeline and workflow and how do we systematize that and streamline it so we can, you know, access, provide access to a lot, a lot more diverse people. So I think that's a really kind of cool, uh, cool approach that that uh, that we're all taking. Um, any, I mean, is any other thinking around that um, from Upendra or Pravin or, or Arla? And how can we, you know, maybe make these pipelines, you know, more easy and more accessible? Right. Um, and, um, you know, great point there, David. Um, and adding on to it as well, um, you know, um, it, when, when we also talk about these, uh, you know, the democratizing pipelines as well, um, then um, hopefully, like, you know, with something that I alluded to, you know, where there is this uh, exchange possible is maybe uh, we could also have some kind of uh, uh, information exchange between the users, possible future users for these kind of like uh, platforms, where we could also talk about, you know, um, what are the um, necessity, uh, you know, plumbing that might be required uh, here, um, you know, uh, looking at it from also from the long term perspective, uh, and what can be more optimized, or what can be more efficient. Um, and not only that, maybe, you know, what are the different data sources, like, you know, which we can also pull in for one thing which I alluded to, um, is a lot of the uh, metadata that's actually getting stored, um, uh, collected from the farms, right? Uh, which farmers input, right? Um, uh, in multiple languages, you know, that's uh, a lot of the, those information is collected, but it's uh, somehow, you know, even as we speak, AI, you know, the combination of uh, the text data with the images is something that's being integrated into the AI system, not as separate, uh, functions, you know, as separate modules or separate entities, but somehow that integration is also happening even as we speak, you know. Um, so all that is, I think, uh, you know, um, uh, something like a consortium like this, you know, bringing together these uh, different users uh, and those who are building these platforms and everything really helps, right? Um, so so the, the other thing is the cost then, right? Um, for democratization, I think uh, Upendra, you brought this up as well. Uh, you know, some of the costs for, let's say, computational resources is, is quite high. Um, what are some of your thoughts on how we can make um, costs, you know, more approachable for a lot of, I, I'm thinking again about smaller users, right? Uh, use, small individual users or maybe smaller uh, groups of people or, or organizations who want to focus on maybe more highly localized uh, problems. Now, how, do we, how do we, you know, get at that? Upendra, uh, what's your perspective from Microsoft's uh, angle. Yeah. Uh, the entire cloud concept has come uh, just because you want to utilize the resources effectively. So if even if you take about the multiple customers, I mean, if let us assume that uh, 10 people are trying to get the data, if we, if we can schedule all the 10 people jobs on this single mission, and if we can sh do the sharing mechanism, definitely the costs are going to go down. With the advent of, I mean, uh, going forward, right, the uh, hardware prices are dropping down and uh, we are getting the powerful missions at a cheaper price. So going forward, I see uh, even the uh, data and uh, AI machine, machine learning models can be done at a cheaper price. 
Well, I think we're going to wrap this up now. I, I want to thank each one of you, you know, Praveen, uh, Orla, and Upendra. This has been a really fantastic discussion and uh, really a, a great panel uh, presentations from all of you. And, and uh, I'm very grateful. Thank you for your time. Um, we very much appreciate your involvement and, and hope to see you again within the convention and also maybe. So thank you again very much.